All right, so let's get started. Um, so starting lecture three, finally. Uh, I hope everyone kind of enjoyed last week's talk uh, from Judson. Uh, the video kind of malfunctioned. I think it was because we used Google Slides to present instead of PowerPoint. So it didn't record quite right, but we're going to fix it and try to upload that talk um, so that you can have it online on YouTube. Uh, but for now, we've got to edit it and figure out how to re-record some parts of it and whatnot uh, because, like I said, it messed up a little bit. So a couple quick updates. Uh, homework 01 is assigned. So if you haven't looked on Dropbox, it's due on the 27th at 11.59 p.m. Um, so start early, please. If you email me the night of, like at 11 p.m., I'm not answering. <laughs> like. I might try to answer some questions like if it's a couple hours before, but uh, if I'm busy, then like like start early. Like don't just wait till the last minute to ask me questions. Like at least read over it now. You don't have to start now, but at least read over to make sure you know kind of how much time you need to allocate. Uh, no quiz this week. Um, so we'll have a quiz next week. Go ahead and announce that. Uh, and I'll tell you what it's on more specifically after we get done with lecture today. Um, so yeah, quiz zero two will be next week, Wednesday and Thursday, depending on which section you're on, and it'll be on today's lecture. Um, so another quick thing, the ACM uh, is having a coding codathon. They have one like almost every semester or every year. I did it when I was an undergrad. It was really fun. You can earn money this time. It used to be you just earned a mug or got a mug or something like a cool little prize, raspberry pie, whatnot. Now you actually, I guess, get cash. Um, so yeah, there's pizza stuff. like That's one of the uh, members in here is one of the officers uh, in ACM. So yeah, it's free. It's fun. It's nice to collaborate, learn some new languages, uh, kind of see, have some fun uh, together. So I may even show up at one point or another because I like to do the problems myself. It keeps me on my toes. Um, so yeah, there's different divisions usually, like depending on what kind of coding level you're at. Like if you're in 145, you have a certain set of problems. If you're in uh, 240, you have a different set of problems. If you're in 350, you have a different set of problems. But yeah, feel free to come. Uh, like I said, it's usually pretty fun. I enjoyed it uh, when I was an undergrad. So yeah, so from there, uh, we've gone through a lot. Uh, we've spent the last couple weeks on Vim, and like we created our first script in lab this semester or this past week. Uh, so we learned paths, some basic uh, commands. I usually just put these as reminders inside of the slides so that you can look back at a glance and see which commands we've seen and which ones we haven't and whatnot. Uh, of course, case matters. Uh, if you haven't seen that, then yeah. Case matters. Uh, why is Vim important? We've went over that. We've talked about creating a file. We've gone over insert mode, write and quit. All these things were on the quiz. So hopefully you kind of know them now. OK. So what are we going to learn today? Command line arguments, how to actually expand the functionality of the commands we've already learned, as well as learn some new ones that really rely on command line arguments and options. So what are command line arguments or options? So it's just really just additional input. So like we've done like vim file name, the file name is an argument, right? It's just a parameter or some kind of input file or path or whatnot to modify things. Uh, but there's also these things called options, which expand the functionalities of just the base command like list. ls is one version of list. But then you have ls-a, then you have ls-l, then you have ls-al. There's, there's tons of variants, and all of them are more specific or give you more information. All right. So one thing you should know is the shell, when you give these arguments, when you type in a command, when you give a command an argument, the shell, bash, will actually take these arguments and put them into the program. So the shell is actually taking what you type and feeding it to the program. Uh, we'll, we'll see that more in a second. Um, so yeah, what do I mean by it changes the functionality, so it can change what a command does, it can be used for more detail, allows you to do more, be more specific, there's a ton of things that uh, 
this leave command line arguments can do. And then there's tons of them usually. So what are options? Sometimes people call them flags or some other things. Uh, but options are, in general, the thing that expand functionality. So your arguments are usually the things that you want to give to the command to process on, like a file or some kind of data and whatnot. Uh, but the options actually tell the command what to do with this data, how to, how to do things with it. So usually these options start with a single dash or a double dash. So single dash is usually the short version of it. So when you have dash L, there's a synonymous one probably called dash dash long. So when you have two dashes, it's usually a, a longer, more spelled out verbose kind of thing what it does or option. But there's a shortened version dash L to kind of save you some time. We'll see it in a second. So how do you find these? You use the man page. So we've done it a couple times. You do man and then the command name, and then it will show you a big list of things of what you can do. And then if you ever want to see kind of a shorter version of the man page, uh, typically they'll implement that as the dash h or the dash dash help flag or option. Uh, and this will give you kind of a shortened summarized list of what the command can do. All right, so an example. Uh, cp-r, so copy, we've been just copying files lately. We haven't gotten to the point of copying directories in all its contents. So copy has dash r, that's an option, and it stands for recursive, and all this does is allows copy to copy directories in all of its contents. So you have a directory, you do cp-r directory, give it where it needs to end up and what the new name, if you want a new name, of the directory to be, and then it copies the directory and all of its contents. Um, so just like right click and copy a directory. All right, so if I show you how to do that real quick, so I'm gonna just go to my desktop. I'm gonna create a directory called um, a demo. Do demo, go into demo, touch, uh, file, and we'll learn this syntax in a little bit. Some of you maybe have seen it in the, uh, the lab. So that creates four different files. We'll learn the curly braces and everything later. So that creates four files. And we want to copy this, all these files and this whole directory um, at once. So we do cp-r demo to new demo. And so now we have demo, this demo directory right here, but we also have the new demo directory. And if we do ls new demo, then we've got those five. So they're empty, but they could have text in them. Yeah. So it'll give you an error. So if I do cp demo to test demo, and you say it says demo is a directory, not copy. So it'll say something similar in the labs. Because I'm using my Mac, it might be a little bit different. But in general, CP by itself will not copy a directory in its contents. Uh, it will throw an error like that. So. so yeah, so that's one example of an option. We'll get in more detail. So what are arguments then? So arguments are just command parameters. So that means that options are also command arguments. So when you hash in dash R or dash H or some kind of option, that's also an argument. But not, not all arguments are options, though. Like I said, an argument can be a file path, it can be a file name, it can be uh, some kind of text or something like that, echo. Like, like echo. Uh, not all command arguments are options. Options are the ones that start with dashes, usually. Those are the ones. And you'll get used to the kind of the options being dashes. So, so what is a command? So I just want you to think about commands differently. We've just learned, oh, we can type something in a terminal or in a shell, and it will just run, right, run something. But all these different commands are just programs or functions or scripts. There, there's not, there, it's not something magical that's happening. There, somebody wrote the program for LS. Somebody wrote the program for CD. Um, so all those are programs. So when you do CD a directory name, it's just like the directory name is just like a function parameter or a method. So if you're used to Java, you call them methods. If you're used to C++, it's called a function. 
or if you're a math person, it's also called a function. So in general, you'll never use the word method ever again once you get past 145 in Java. Uh, most people call them functions. So yeah, you just have your command like cd, it takes in an argument which, or a parameter with a directory name. Yeah, it's just a program. All right, so options are arguments. This, is, this will come up not necessarily this week in lab, but in a couple weeks, um, are indexed. So I told you that the shell takes the arguments and the options and then feeds them to the script or program. It kind of connects them together. So how does it do that? How does it index these, right? So we have index zero as the command itself. So when I say CMD, it just means it's short for command. Then you have your options at index one and see that e each time we have a space, there's a new index. We have a new index. So what is this one? What index is lab03.tar.gz? Two. Yeah. So that's index two, and that's an argument. And then lab03, index three. So we'll see this later in a couple weeks, but you can access each of these arguments inside of a script or a program. Uh, and I'll teach you how to do this. Uh, so you can write your own scripts with this owns options and whatnot. Yeah. What do you mean? Yeah, so it just shifts over. So if you get rid of dash zcdf, then lab03.targz would be at index one. Right, but that's not a general what? What's well, not a general rule? The... No, some commands don't have to have an option at all, like uh, move. Move, you just have a fi previous file name, new file name, if you want to rename something. So yeah, this, is, this will come up in your scripting later on. I just want you to think, Okay, the first command is index zero. Then, okay, whatever comes after that first space is index one. Then we have another space, and then there's index two, and then we have another space, index three. So you could have however many infinitely number or arbitrary number of commands and arguments and options and whatnot chained together. You just need to know that this index zero to however many you want. Okay, so how do I find these options? So there's two different options here. Huh funny. Um, so there's two different thing, ways of finding them. You can use man. Uh, so man, I sometimes find tedious, but it's good to know. So if you don't have access to Google or a search uh, web browser or whatnot, then you should know how to use man. Because some, you're, you're not always going to have Google. So it's good to know man still. So if we do man on something like GCC, Let me, well, maybe it doesn't have it. Let me zoom in a little bit. If we do man on something like ls, because I don't have GCC installed, uh, it gives you a big chunk of text. We've seen this before when I first taught the man command, right? But now you can make a little bit of sense of it now. So we have ls, and it sometimes will say options and whatnot, where to place them and whatnot, because sometimes some commands require you to put options in a certain order. Uh, they're called po positional arguments or options. Uh, but you, you'll figure that out as you go. So if we scroll down a little bit, you'll see that you've got these dash A, dash B, all these different things right here. And these are your options that you have to choose from. So there's a ton of them. You can keep going and going and going and going and going. Uh, but sometimes you might want to just search what it is. So in the last lab, we saw dash A with ls. If we search for it, so the same way we search in vim, we search in the man command. So you see how I have a colon at the very bottom left down here? If I type a, a slash, and now I have a slash, if I search for um, current, maybe, you it, it starts searching the man command. So this makes things a lot faster. And, and to go from one to the next, you just do in and shift in like you do in Vim. So a lot of the Vim kind of shortcuts will come in handy when you do the uh, man command. But in this case, we want to see what dash A corresponds to. So let's see. Let's find the actual dash A. Um, let's see. Dash A. There it is. 
So there's dash a. So what does it say? It includes directory entries whose name would begin with a dot, which is exactly what we did in the last lab, or, or with the bit.demrc. Uh, as you have a, a file with a dot, it doesn't show up normally. When you do ls-a, it does show those hidden files that start with a dot. All right, there's an alternative, dash capital A, right there, and it's including the same thing that a dash A does, but it excludes the dot and the dot dot directory. So that current directory, when you do ls-l, let me show you what I'm talking about, ls-a, you get these two results right here. You get this dot and dot dot directory. And we've learned what those stand for. But if you want to get rid of those, so you don't have as those two redundant things every single time, you do ls dash capital A, and it gets rid of those just dot and dot dot uh, relative paths or directories. But yeah, anyway, my point here is you can use the man commands uh, or the man pages to see all your different choices of functionality. All right. So how do I read the manual? We just went over this. Open the manual with the man command, uh, type flash, then enter a search criteria like you're used to in Vim, and then scroll up and down with the arrow keys, page up, page down, look through the results. Um, and like I said, if, if you can't find what you want in the man pages, uh, if you do man on something like, let's see if I have G++. No, I don't. Uh, let's see. What's another make, maybe? There we go. Some, some manual pages, this one maybe not in particular, are very, very long. And sometimes you just want to Google things. It's going to be much quicker. Or you can use the little uh, preview or, what is it, review sheet that I gave you on Dropbox. Use Control F. Um, yeah. OK, so another option that you have to get help or understand what your options are when it comes to finding options is dash H or dash dash help. So most commands will have something like this. So if you do uh, ls-h, you, instead of doing the man command, you can do ls-h. Uh, and sometimes it'll work. So in this case, dash h is not helpful here because uh, ls-h doesn't actually give us the help page. Uh, and sometimes help doesn't even exist on some commands. But there are commands, I'm trying to think of one, dash h. That do have this help page. So if I do like something like Python, it gives you this kind of summary of what each option does. So you can either use man, Google, or dash h. Uh, but not everything is guaranteed to have dash h or a man page. Uh, that's why I like to go Google because it, you're almost guaranteed to find something. All right. So like I said, most common commands have the dash h flag. Uh, or dash dash help, it usually has one or the other. Sometimes it doesn't have either. Um, it's usually a good bit shorter instead of looking at the man page. Um, yeah, and if I had GCC installed on my Mac, you could see that man GCC is like thousands of pages long. Um, so yeah, shortens your life a little bit uh, as far as uh, having to go through all the man pages. Okay, so list. So we've seen dash A. Shows all the things, including the hidden files, starting with a dot. There's dash L now. So this is another thing we'll use in the semester. Um, get do ls dash L. The only thing different between ls and this is it gives you more information about the file. So now you have your permissions. So you have read, write, execute, read, write, execute, whatnot. We'll learn more about this permissions later in the semester. You have the person who created it, what group they're in, the file size or directory size. You've got the date last modified, et cetera. And then if you look at here, you can tell whether something's a directory or not if they have a D in that leftmost spot with the directory. So let me just zoom out a little bit so it's easier to read. So if it has a D right here in this leftmost spot, then it's a directory. So ls-l just gives you more information about your files and stuff like timestamps and everything. So, okay. And there's a ton more with ls, but we're not going to go through all of them. Uh, you can alternatively also c combine things. So we have ls-a, right, that shows the hidden files. Then you have ls-l, 
What if you want to do both of them at the same time, right? We do something really, really uh, interesting. We do dash al. And when we do this, it gives us the long or the uh, long format with the more information as well as gives it us the hidden files as well. So now we have this .ds store and .localized and whatnot. Um, better example would be maybe looking at home directory. So if I just do ls-a here, that's what you see. If I do ls-al, it gives you your timestamps and everything about everything, including the hidden files and directories. Okay, so more stuff that you're learning about ls. LS is not just as simple as you thought it was. Um, okay, so the move command, I don't really re use options when it comes to move command because um, you can kind of do this more or less without doing these. Um, so right now, up until now, we've been only moving one file at a time or moving one directory at a time or renaming things one at a time. Well, you can actually move multiple things at a time and the way you do that is you can do um, give move and then tell it what you want to move and then give it the destination at the very end. So we look at, let's see, so let's just go over what move does. So we move one file into a new location, that's this first line. Then we move multiple directories into another directory. So we have a directory named done, we have a directory named temp. We're moving both of these into the submissions directory. So that's what this dash T stands for. It stands for the target of where you want to put things. So we're moving two directories into submissions. So you can do multiple moves. Um, we can rename stuff with move. Um, yeah. So the point is, is this dash T allows you to specify where you want to move something to if you're doing multiple things at a time. Uh, you could also just omit the T. Uh, the dash T, and just do move, done, temp, and then the last one is considered the destination. Um, so either way, there's multiple ways of doing things. We've seen this multiple times already. Okay, remove. So caution sign. Please be careful. This. So if if you weren't scared of, scared of the remove uh, command already, you should be scared now. Uh, because, yeah, if I haven't made it clear enough, be careful. Um, Dash R is the recursive delete. So just like copy has a recursive copy, dash R, when you add it to R and M, will allow you to delete directories. So R M by itself is just for files. But if you want to delete directories, you have to do R M space dash R. And that's when you can start d deleting a lot of stuff. So deleting one file is not that like dangerous. But when you start deleting a ton of directories with a ton of files in them, that's when things get really nasty. Especially when you do this dash F. Yeah. What? Yeah. So in general, if you're wanting to delete files, use RM. If you want to delete a directory, use dash R. If for some reason it still doesn't let you delete what you want to delete, and you're sure that you want to delete it, you can use dash F. And this is the dangerous part, because it will not warn you. Because sometimes what dash R will actually warn you, say, hey, are you sure you want to delete this? But if you do dash F, it's gone. It immediately deletes it, yeah. So sudo will still sometimes warn you. Uh, if you do sudo, which takes you into like root mode, like highest administrator mode, um, you can delete things quicker or more protected files, but if you, it will still sometimes warn you without dash F. If you use dash F, it's gone no matter what. It's going to force delete it. So, yeah. So please be careful. Try not to ever do RF unless you have a specific reason and you're absolutely sure that you're doing what you think you are doing. So, um, and then there's dash D if you want to remove directories that are empty. Um, so, yeah. Try to minimize what flags you give the RM command. Because like I said, you can do a lot of damage. You can really screw yourself up on a homework and whatnot uh, if you're using RM uh, without any kind of precaution. Okay. Like I said, I usually like to take something, and instead of deleting it, I'll just move it into a directory named old. Uh, so that way I'm not deleting anything yet, but when I want to go back and clean things up, then I do it. Yeah. 
you have to specify it. So if you give uh, a directory that's not empty, it'll throw an error and say, hey, this directory is not empty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the tar command has dash zcvf, right? Which we'll learn in a second as well. So you can use multiple options, as many as you want, as long as they make sense together. Which you kind of have to read the manual page or something to figure out which ones work together and which ones don't. Okay. So, like I said, please be careful. You know, the most dangerous command, and I warn everyone just so that they don't accidentally type it or that it will be ingrained in your memory forever. Let me do echo before it so I don't accidentally delete everything. This is the most dangerous command. Actually, this is the most dangerous command. We'll learn what sudo does later in the semester, but this is the most dangerous command you can ever type in your terminal because this will delete, in theory, the whole file system or this. So if you want to really, I've never ran this command and I don't plan to unless it's like a segregated machine. But yeah, this will delete the entire file system, theoretically. Whether it works or not, I've never tried. I don't want to try. So please be careful. If you ever type this, uh, you shouldn't have a reason to. Yeah. <laughs> Challenge accepted. So I'll spin it up now, but we'll see if we have time to get to it at the end. So I'll teach you a little bit of what Docker is later in the semester, but I'll spin it up and we'll try it at the end if we have time. Okay. So um, now I can't say I've never tried it because then, then now people will be like, oh, well, now we know what it does and it's not as scary, right? Um, okay. So, copy, we've seen dash r, so kind of recurring thing. This just shows you what copy does. It just, we have two directories, ls submissions and done. Um, submissions has lab03.txt in it. Done has nothing in it. We copy submissions to done with the dash r flag. It copies the entire directory. Yeah, you see what's going on here. All right. So, yeah. Okay, so some new commands. Tar. So I put this little zip figure, so you can think of it as zipping a file. So if you're used to Windows or Mac or anything like that and you ever downloaded a .zip folder, then that's what this is. This is essentially doing the same thing as zipping or archiving and uh, zipping and compressing a file. All right, so tar has the format, tar, options, arguments, right? If we did man, it would give us something very similar to this. So we haven't used dash x yet, but you will. Uh, so dash x just extracts or unzips a tar archive. Uh, dash v stands for verbose. This is a common flag or option in Linux Unix commands as well. Or you can do dash dash verbose instead of dash v, either one. Um, dash c creates a new archive, so c for create. Dash f, you can specify a file name of an archive. Dash Z stands for zip or compress the archive. So that's how you do the zipping of the file. And so in total, if you want to archive and zip a, dir a directory or file in Linux or files, you do tar dash Z for zip that with C for create a new archive, V for ver verbose and F to specify the file name. So this is what you used in lab last week, or you should have. So you specify the archive name. This is the name that the output archive uses. Uh, you can name it anything literally, uh, but the extension helps. And then you give it a directory name or files. So this is all. Yeah. So dash F just lets you uh, name it to your convention. So you can name it anything. You can name it like uh, something without tar gz. You can name it just dot tar. You can name it dot gz. Uh, it really doesn't matter. Dash f file name. Exactly. So if I have a, a folder and I'm zipping it up, 
This lets me specify what that zip folder's name is. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm missing a C. Typo. But, um, okay, so what if you want to unpack? So we, this, this command right here, packed everything up into one nice little file, zipped it up like, a, like your suitcase that you're taking on a trip. Um, how, do, how do we unzip it? How do we unarchive it? Well, you do that with tar, and now instead of creating one, so we don't need the dash C command anymore, neither do we need the dash Z anymore. Um, so we do just do tar dash XVF. Uh, pass in the archive name, it'll extract everything and whatnot. So quick demo on that. So if we go to the desktop, we have that demo, this demo file, right? Uh, and inside a demo, we have a couple files, right? So if I do tar dash zcvf demo dot tar dot gz, and then do uh, demo, press enter, it archives everything together. So this is slightly different, like I said, but you'll see something different, uh, pretty much the same on the Linux side. All right, so the output of this is this demo.tar.gz file. Now, like you said earlier the, with the question about F, you can name this anything. So I could say uh, hello world.tar.gz. This is just the output name. So when we look for our .tar.gz file, that's the name we're looking for, right? So it still took the demo folder and zipped it up, but we just renamed it to something else. That's all that dash F does. It allows you to specifically say, this is what I want out of this program. Yeah. Sometimes. So it, sometimes commands will tell you. Uh, so if we do man tar, it kind of sometimes tries to tell you what order to put them in. So right here with the synopsis right here, you can have bundled flags, which is what we did, dash zcdf, that's bundled together. And then you have files and patterns and whatnot. So sometimes order does matter. The command will usually tell you if the order matters or not. So alternatively, if we wanted to do something similar, so hello world and demo, let's just delete these. So if we want to do tar-zcvf, and then we can do demo, or let's do zcv demo, and then we want to do dash f, we can also do that, and then do demo.tar.gc. And cannot start, yeah, so sometimes order does matter. So, and I mean, it's kind of a trial and error thing. Uh, I just remember this this command up here uh, that we'd used earlier with the ZCVF and whatnot. And we'll learn later in the semester, or even maybe this week in lab, you can actually shorten this a lot uh, by creating what's called an alias. Uh, and that will make things a lot simpler for you. Um, okay. Or I might, actually I'll just show you now. So if you ever want to make a short, like shortened command, all you have to do is type alias and then tell it what you want the alias to be. So in this case, I'm gonna do ls a, right, equals ls dash a, like this. So instead of typing ls space dash a, you can just do ls a. If you do this, and then type ls a, you got a shorthand. So just keep in mind this alias is only good for your terminal, not for other terminals that you may open in the future. Um, but you can create like little shorthands and abbreviations like this. So just by doing alias, the abbreviation equals whatever the command should be. Yeah. So you can edit your, it's called your bash, bash configuration file and add this in it and it will, every time you open the terminal, it'll keep, it'll keep this alias. But we'll learn this later. If you want to know it now, then I can show you uh, in lab this week. Okay. So yeah, that's tar. Nothing extremely special, it's just a lot to remember. Like I said, we'll learn how to abbreviate this with an alias and or a function later. All right, so git. Um, so git, I, I think I mentioned at the beginning of the class, uh, Linux was created by Linus Torvalds. 
He was like in his 20s at the time, going to college, he decided, oh, I'm going to do this project and built Linux, right? Uh, or at least a very uh, early version of it uh, he was building. It was just a project that he was doing. His other project that he's well known for is Git. So there's Git, and then there's GitHub, and then there's GitLab and everything, but the thing that they all have in common is Git. So what is Git? So Git is another command you can use. You have to install it usually on the Linux lab that's already there. Um, and it's just version control. So what do I mean by version control? Well, it's, it's, if you ever used Google Drive and you have multiple versions of a document, it basically backs up and allows you to revert changes uh, to a previous version. Um, so you can do all kinds of things with Git. You can do version control um, and a ton of things like storing your code, creating branches, whatnot. We'll go over it later in the semester. Um, so yeah, it's good for organizing code. It's good for tracking your changes, making sure that you know what you changed, and uh, being able to revert them if you have some kind of bug that you need to take out. All right, so what GitHub and all the websites that use Git are good for is collaboration. Uh, so Git by itself kind of allows you to collaborate, but it's a little bit harder. So what GitHub and GitLab and all these different Git uh, websites do is they allow for easier collaboration. So you, instead of having to send a message back and forth to your person, okay, I'm ready, here's the code, or whatnot, send things back and forth, Git just GitHub just allows you to do it uh, online. Okay, so here are some commands. Uh, you don't have to memorize them now. These are just helpful. These are one the basic commands that throughout your career you'll eventually just learn by memory. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them because the homework does this a little bit. Um, so yeah, uh, and I'll kind of go over it in a second. If you ever need, don't want to remember these, like 10 common Git commands, GitHub has provided a cheat sheet that you can go and look at, and it has a nice little kind of cheat sheet that you can look at and not have to remember. So and it tells you what each one does and whatnot. So it's about two pages long. You don't have, I, I don't remember most of these by memory. I just remember those 10 that are on the slide, and then I'm pretty good um, and whatnot. OK, so homework demo. So yeah, so I assigned the homework. And previously in this course, Git was not part of the course. I added it so that you would know how to use it, because it is very helpful. <coughs> Um, to use. So if you're doing a project, especially you, uh, with uh, group members, you can collaborate and not trample over each other's work and say, okay, now I'm waiting on you to finish this. You can all work in parallel on GitHub. So what your GitHub uh, homework assignment does, you obviously have to have a GitHub account. From there, you have to create a repository. So this is all done on the website. The first part of the homework is done on the website. You create a repository, you click, a new, you click the plus button, uh, click new repository, you fill out this form, and then it creates like a, like a directory, so-called, uh, on GitHub. Then you have to go to the command line and start setting up Git on the command line. So every time you go to a new computer, you have to enter these two commands and give it your first name, last name, your email, whatnot. From there, you can uh, customize your SSH config so this is actually the best way of doing it nowadays. You used to be able to just enter your password with Git, but that's deprecated, and they still allow it, but it's not a good idea. Um, so yeah, so you create some configuration files, whatnot. You quit. You create some SSH keys that I kind of alluded to earlier uh, in the class. You do all this. Um, OK, the important part, before I actually show you a demo, uh, demo of this, is this statement. So be sure, oh, uh, no, not in your home directory, sorry. That's not the right statement. Here it is. You must record all of the correct commands you use for this part. So for section four, you should write inside of a file what commands you used. Uh, if you do not do this, then you will not get full credit. Because how do I know that you actually did the homework without knowing what commands you did? Um, so please record your commands. If you forget to do this, this step to add, add the commands to a file, then section six 
tells you how to go back and get your commands. So section six is for those who didn't listen or read the instructions. Uh, if you didn't do, read the instructions, you can go to the bash history file and whatnot and find them uh, most of the time, yeah. No. Yes, I would. Because um, PowerShell doesn't necessarily guarantee that you have all the commands you need to do this. But, okay, so I'm going to show you actually how to do this instead of just reading through the doc. Okay, so first things first, you created a GitHub account, which I have one, right? Um, from here, you click on this new button and click new repository. And from there, you add the repository names. And I already have this name already. So it'll tell you if it exists already. But yeah, this, that's the name of your repository that you're going to create. So typically, this is a convention. Your dot .files directory or repository on GitHub is used for scripts and configuration files, um, aka dot .files. Uh, you don't have to put a description. You can if you want to. Uh, you have to make it public. If you make it private, then we can't grade your work. Because part of submitting your uh, GitHub, this homework assignment, is you have to submit the URL of this GitHub repository. If you don't have it public, then we can't see it, right? Um, so yeah, make it public so that the TAs can actually see it. Um, you do not want to do this step. Just skip all this. Because if you do it, it's going to make your life a lot harder, uh, and we'll have to do some extra steps uh, that's outside of the homework. And then you just click click create a repository. So it's grayed out for me because I already have a repository name this. All right? So not too bad, right? So that's the website part, part of it at least. From there, you go to your command line and we'll create these SSH keys. So I'm going to go up to my home directory and then I go to my .ssh directory. So this should look a little bit familiar. And then from here, I have a ton of them, right? And this contains my keys that I have. So I have one specifically, I guess I don't have one for GitHub, so let's create it. So make directory GitHub, right? And then inside of here, go into the GitHub directory, and we do this SSH keygen command. So in your homework, I give it to you. So literally, all you have to do is copy and paste it. So it's this one right here. Copy paste that. Boom. Enter. And so what it's going to ask you for is for a passphrase. This is optional. You don't have to do it. But because you're on the Unix Linux labs and those computers are shared, I would advise you to set a passphrase. Uh, this is just a security thing. If you're sharing a computer, you should have a passphrase. If you're not sharing a computer, if you're doing it on your a home computer, then you don't have to do it. But I would highly advise you, for security's sake, put a passphrase uh, if you're doing it on the Linux labs. All right, so like I said, it's optional. And then it gives you this. Uh, so we've kind of seen this before. And again, you're, you get these two resulting files. So this is your private key, and this is your public key. The public key is what you need to put on GitHub. You can share this public key with anyone that can't do any damage to you, really. Uh, this private key, however, if you put it on GitHub, like I warned earlier in the semester, if you put the private key on GitHub, you will get a zero at the beginning of your assignment. So when you submit it the first time, you'll get a zero because you exposed a security flaw to your account. This basically gives access to your entire account, by the way. Um, so if you do this, you'll get a zero. Like I'm just telling you, you better not upload this. Um, we'll, we'll talk about how you can like get back from zero. You can make it up or whatnot. But I want this to be clear that this is like a password. You don't share passwords in, with anyone unless it's maybe for Netflix, but they're frowning upon that now. Uh, so, but you do not want to share this password because people can do some harm. They can delete all your repositories and whatnot. Yeah. So you got to delete the entire repository and start over. So yeah, if you share your key, your private key, on accident, you have to delete the, these keys right here with RM, and then you have to start over the assignment. So don't upload this at all. Make sure you don't. Yeah. No. So 
So they're com two completely different things. So if I cat idedpub that's what the pub file looks like, oh. right? Cat the one that's not pub, that's what the private key looks like. And I'm, like I said, I'm deleting these two keys after class so you can't get access to things. Plus, I haven't uploaded this, so it doesn't give you any access already. So, but yeah, you should not upload the file that has this. It even says private key right there. Private keys are private. So once you do that, you, you take this pub file, you'll cat the pub file, not that one, cat ided.pub, you'll take this, You'll copy it, you'll go to your settings up here, and then you'll go to SSH and GPG keys, and inside there you'll add a new key, you'll paste the, uh, the public key, the .pub contents, and then that basically connects your command line to GitHub, to where you can actually add stuff on that GitHub re repo. And then from there you can do some stuff with Git. Um, but yeah. So start early. This is a long process. It's not hard, but it's a long process, and there's a lot of room for error. So start early so that you have time to ask me questions. So yeah, you're free to go.